go back. I don't want to be on the About Me slide yet. I want to be on the title slide. All right, thank you everybody for coming today. Uh, I am Alex Corvin, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about handling chaos in containerized environments. Specifically, I'm going to focus really on Kubernetes or OpenShift containerized environments. I feel like I'm cutting out, but I don't know. Um, all right, so real quick, just a little bit about me. I am a software engineer at Red Hat. Um, I work right now on the Open Data Hub project. If you've, you've maybe have heard about the Open Data Hub project at some of the other talks, we were giving several this, this weekend. Um, and I focus mainly on the internal Red Hat instance of the Open Data Hub. So we create a platform for other teams at Red Hat to be able to like perform their data science and analytics experiments and work and give them a platform for storing all their data, right? Um, and one of the things we really focus on is like enabling teams at Red Hat to become what we say like more data centric. So teach them to do data analysis, teach them to you know work with big data, that kind of thing. Um, and, and my job primarily is to like I'm, I'm mostly tasked with keeping the internal data hub stable um, making sure it's you know highly available making sure we have good uptime so that the teams that rely on us can actually you know have a data platform that they can that they can rely on right and use um, so you know I'm, I'm in general I'm, I'm super passionate about like site rel super passionate about site reliability engineering DevOps that kind of thing um, don't really think of myself as a developer I'm kind of a, a systems guy but I like to code, so so that's what I do. Um, and then, just a fun thing about me, I'm a beekeeper, so I get really bored if I don't have a lot of projects. Beekeeping is one of them. Um, it's usually an interesting thing to talk about, so if you want to talk about beekeeping, hit me up. Um, so so to, dive, to dive in, what we're going to be talking about today, um, I'm going to cover, first, what do I mean by, by chaos? Um, we'll go on that on the next slide. Um, you know, kind of like how we would have handled that chaos in more traditional environments that weren't containerized. And then I'll talk about how OpenShift can help you cope with this chaos. I think it has a, a lot of ways it can help you manage it that are, are a lot better than, than what it worked like in the traditional ways. Um, and I'll, I'll do, I think, three kind of hands-on demos with that um, and talk about two other ways that I won't be able to demo. Um, and then finally, I'll make some recommendations on just like ways I think that you can build cultures and teams that plan for this chaos and expect the chaos and learn to kind of manage and, and control it. Um, and I'm hoping that I'll have some time at the end for questions, so we'll see. Um, so first of all, what do I mean by, by chaos? I, I made this kind of cool word map with, with some things. Um, I had fun putting gremlins on there. But so, so basically what I mean by chaos is that if you've ever run a production system at scale, like you probably know that eventually kind of just weird things happen, right? Um, you may maybe know somebody or know a story about somebody who accidentally dropped like your production database table. Or maybe like you rolled out a software patch and it turned out that that software patch just let anybody log in with any blank password. Or maybe somebody thought they were in the staging pre-production environment and they like, you know, scheduled like a, a, a failover of your edge load balancer and it turns out they were in production and it just killed all your connections. Um, you know, weird things happen. Those three examples are all things that have happened on teams that I'm on. So I've been on, not, not anymore. It, it wasn't a niche, I promise. Um, <laughs> so anyways, like, we all know that we should, you know, weird things happen, right? We all know that we should follow the best practices for testing our, our code, right? But, you know, deadlines are a real thing and, and you've got to rush to get software out and maybe you don't test all the edge cases and then it turns out that some like weird non-unicode character comes in and it just breaks everything, right? Um, you know, maybe, maybe it's not human error at all. Maybe, oh, I went to the wrong slide, hold on. I was trying to scroll, go back. This is where I want to be. Where's my mouse? I gotta find my mouse. Okay, I found my mouse. Um, <laughs> maybe it's not human error at all, right? Maybe maybe your network is a little flaky. Maybe maybe an AWS region goes down, right, and takes down half the internet, and you can't watch Netflix anymore. Maybe your hardware fails. Maybe Russian hackers dosh you, right, because you know they 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 want to steal your money, right? Um, and, and so like maybe the chaos is is not a bad thing. Maybe your system has like grown and become really popular and now you're a millionaire, 
maybe you're a billionaire, right? And you bought an island, and instead you're just hanging out on your island in your swimming pool filled with gold, and then you just forget to scale your system, right? So you're so busy counting your money that you forget to plan for capacity planning, and then you know you have a, a weird spike in traffic, and it brings down your system, right? So so all this stuff can happen, and like to account for it, I think you do. Like you can do one of two things, right? Maybe you hire a team of like 500 full-time engineers, and you know they maintain the system night and day, and everybody's really busy, and and, and you know it kind of sucks. Or maybe you're a team of one, and your phone is constantly buzzing, and like you're on every night and weekend, and you don't get to sleep at all, and your family hates you, and like you're just miserable, right? And and, and neither of these solutions is is really very good long term, right? Neither one of these is going to scale, but. If if you don't do anything, then your just your just app is going to succumb to the chaos, right? And it's going to fail, and you're going to go out of business. So so what do we do about this, right? Um, I think in the kind of traditional world, I'm going to I'm going to tell a story of how this worked kind of before containers and before OpenShift. Let's say you have an app, right? You're a cool new startup. You develop you know the cool new app. Maybe your Instagram or you know whatever's going to replace Instagram. So you deploy this app on a server, right? Um, it turns out that you're trying to get up and running really fast. You deploy this app. You don't really take time for proper configuration management or deployment automation or like tests because those are for losers and you know who wants to monitor? Monitoring's for dummies, right? So you just get it out there really fast. But it turns out people like your app, so you decide you need to scale your app. So you deploy a few more instances of it. You, you spin up a few more AWS servers or whatever, and now you're you're highly available, right? Because you've got four instances, and uh, maybe maybe you buy like a load balancer to put in front of it, right? So now you, you're you're redundant, right? And that's cool. Um, and then you know, it turns out that people like really like your app, and people all over the world are are using your app. And so now you have to spin up like multiple data centers. So you're in like London and China and Australia and everywhere, and you're really awesome. But remember, we still haven't taken the time for configuration management. So we're we're just we're super busy having to do all this, right? Um, you know, now you're you're global though, right? So maybe GDPR comes out or CCPA is coming up if you're in California, and so now you've got to start worrying about where is my data located and how can we get access to it? And it's just piling on more more and more processes. That how do we how do we cope with all this, right? And you, you still don't have any like configuration management, you're still doing everything manually, like it's just really hard to do, right? And so you think, oh man, I, that just, this is not scaling, I, I need more people, I can't do this all alone. So now you you like start throwing more people at the problem, right? You hire, hire a couple of engineers. Um, and, and now you have more and more people working on the system, right? And so they, they're starting to like commit conflicting changes and like they're starting to roll out different things at different times and you can't keep track of everything and it's not working. And so you think, oh man, this, I, I'm not good, maybe I should, maybe I should like run on AWS or something. I'm running everything locally in my own data center right now. Maybe it'll help if I, if I switch to VM. So I, I, you do that, right? And so like it's taking more time to manage, it's taking more money to manage, it's taking more time and more money, right? And the chaos continues. So. I don't know if anybody's ever ever dealt with this, but I, I think that it sucks. And I think that luckily there is a better way, and I think that OpenShift can help. So that's my little OpenShift hero guy swooping in. I was looking for a hero with a cape, but my icon library didn't have one. So if you manage the Red Hat icon library, give me a user with a cape. Um, anyways, so OpenShift, I'd say, has, has some really cool features just out of the box that you can use to help with this chaos. Um, as I said, we're going to explore five of them today, and I think three kind of hands-on. So the first one I want to talk about is monitoring. So, you know, in the past we had things like like Zabbix and Nagios and all this other stuff that, that like worked reasonably well, um, but there, there's a new player that's come on the scene called Prometheus. If anybody's used Prometheus, it's really cool, it's really swanky. Um, I would say it's kind of becoming a new standard for monitoring applications. Um, and what's really nice is Prometheus integrates just beautifully with Kubernetes and, and therefore OpenShift. Um, and you can configure it in a way that you just get automatic monitoring scraping of your services. You can you can really easily, if you have a custom like Flask app or whatever, you can very easily add custom metrics into it. Um, if you're running like a MySQL database or whatever, there's like plenty of options for telling Prometheus to just scrape your MySQL server, you know, and you don't have to worry about custom metrics or anything. Like they're just out there, you pull them, right? Um, 
And, and, and so like Prometheus has those native integrations with all sorts of other things. Um, and there's a library or a tool called Grafana that you may or may not know about. It That's been around a bit longer than Prometheus. Um, but it, it's a really nice visualization tool on top of Prometheus. So you can get a really swanky monitoring suite. Um, and then Prometheus has an alert manager component as well that you can configure to generate alerts based on the metrics that it scrapes. Um, and you can, you know, it can send you an email. It can, you know, integrate with Slack or whatever. You can you can have it send a pager duty if you're using that. Like it's, it works really well, right? Um, and so, so real quick, I'm going to try and demo sort of just this. So bear with me. I'm going to see what happens if I drag this over. Okay, I have to escape out of this. I think escape. Cool. So I'm going to do everything over here. Make this bigger. Is that big enough? Can you guys see that? Hopefully. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I don't want to do that. I'm going to switch to screen mirroring because I feel like that'll be easier. Does anybody see my mouse? There it is. Displays. All right, so here's what we're going to do. This is my command line, right? I ran OC, who am I? And I am logged into an OpenShift server. That OpenShift server is running in a few VMs in AWS. It's OpenShift 4, provisioned it a couple days ago. And it should just work fine. And so the first thing I'm going to do, remember I mentioned I work on the Open Data Hub team. Um, and the Open Data Hub team, or the Open Data Hub project, one of the cool things we can do is deploy Prometheus and Grafana for you and configure it all to scrape metrics from any service that's deployed in your OpenShift project and display it in Grafana. So it's kind of cool. Um, I'm going to open up Tmux because I like Tmux. And I'm going to go to. DH internal data. So this is this is a this is not yet a public repo, but something like it will probably be at some point. But it's a um, deploy ODH. So what this is going to do is run an Ansible playbook that deploys the Open Data Hub operator to my OpenShift thing. So this is going to it's actually going to create the OpenShift project for me, which is nice. It's just called DevConf demo, and then it applies a few OpenShift custom resources to it. So if I open up this guy over here, OpenShift, and I go to projects, oh look, I'm already in DevConf demo. That's cool. Um, oh man, I didn't delete the namespace. That's okay. That's going to work out all right. Now I'm going to delete the namespace. OC delete. I didn't clean up after myself last night. Sorry, guys. I want you to get the full experience. That's going to take a couple seconds. So anyways, I'm just going to talk through this. What's going to happen is I'm going to reinstall that uh, Open Data Hub operator, which is going to give you a pod that's running the Open Data Hub operator. And then I'll run another command that's going to create an OpenShift custom, uh, yeah, an OpenShift custom resource for the Open Data Hub operator and tell it that I want to enable monitoring. So I can show you that real quick. So if I look at OpenShift object templates, ODHCR, I can see that down here I'm telling it monitoring true. So that means I want monitoring. Notice I've disabled Jupyter Hub and Spark and Celadon and I guess Jupyter Hub again. I'd have to ask Landon what the difference between AICOE, Jupyter Hub, and Jupyter Hub on OpenShift is. But if you want a Spark deployment or a Jupyter deployment or coming soon like Kafka and then Celadon and then ultimately the Thrift server, Spark, and all that kind of stuff, Explore Open Data Hub because it's really cool and it can give you all that stuff really easily. Today we're just going to do the monitoring aspect. Let's see what's happening with my project deletion. I think that's done. Cool. Let's try that again. Now we can see all this from scratch. So my DevConf demo project got created again. This time there's nothing in it, but now there's an open data operator pod. And so the next thing I'm going to do is deploy that custom resource that we were talking about. So 
full disclosure, this is going to fail first because it waits for it doesn't properly wait for the like Grafana deployment to get created. So I'm going to deploy it. The Open Data Lab operator is going to deploy Prometheus. Um, the Open Data Lab operator does correctly wait for Prometheus to happen because what happens is Prometheus starts up, then it configures Grafana to connect to Prometheus as a data source. Obviously, for that to work, you have to have Prometheus working first. So the Open Data Lab operator actually does wait. My crappily thrown together Ansible does not, and I didn't take the time to fix it. But at some point, this is going to become ready. You know, OC get pods. I'm going to wait for Grafana to switch to ready. This takes a few seconds, I don't know. Test, yes. All right, there we go. So now I should, oh, it's still just one out of two is ready, so I'm going to wait a little bit longer for two out of two. There we go. All right, so I'm going to run that script again. Um, and it is all idempotent, so it'll skip some stuff or not do a changes with some stuff. Um, but then what it will do is create a deployment of a really basic Flask app and then a Prometheus black box exporter, which we can use to run availability checks against you know, any arbitrary HTTP endpoint. Um, and I think that's it. So what I do now is if I go into OpenShift and go to my Grafana route, Oh, the other thing my Ansible does is it gives me a Grafana dashboard, which I just import via YAML. So this takes a little while to set up, but what's going to happen is I have this other deployment, which is a demo app, which gives me a route that I can curl and just hello world, right? Um, one thing that's going to be interesting in a second is this, this host name is going to be the name of the pod. If I curl this over here, it's that, right? Same thing. But hopefully at some point, yeah. So now you can see that this service is now green. It's available. Um, so what's happening here is Prometheus is configured to run at a regular interval checks against that HTTP endpoint. If it's green, it means it's up. It's up. And then over here, this is the number of page count or page hits on it, rather. Um, the, the index route increments a Prometheus counter every time it gets called. So these availability checks are running every five seconds, and it's going up. Um, what's nice, though, is that, like, so these availability checks, there is a little bit of hard coding for these routes. I'm sure you could do it dynamically. I didn't take the time to. But these metric pooling up here for counts are just, like, I told Prometheus to scrape any Kubernetes service that exists. Um, actually, you can enable that and disable that really easily. I'm going to show that because it's cool. OC get service. This guy. OC describe service and that's not right. Standby. There's supposed to be a, uh, oh, yeah, it's an annotation. I was looking under labels. It is under annotations. By setting an annotation of Prometheus.o slash scrape slash true, I'm telling Prometheus to scrape this. So if you spin up a new application and you put an OpenShift or Kubernetes service in front of it and you set this annotation, you automatically get Prometheus scraping, and it's really nice. And I think that pr before Prometheus, if you had like Nagios or, or uh, or whatever, right? Like that was that was a lot more work to set up. Now it's just like you deploy Prometheus once, you configure it correctly, and it's really easy to get monitoring and really easy to start playing with with Grafana graphs and get metrics for your service, and it's awesome. Um, so the next thing, I'm going to go back to my presentation, and I'm going to step forward to high availability. So. Um, I'm not going to spend much time in the slides because I'm just going to demo this again. So, so let me let me do this. I'm going to make this smaller, and we're going to watch kind of in the background that's green right now. I'm going to do OC get pods. So this is this is the one instance of my API running right. It's in this pod here, and let's say like some sort of chaos happens and your pod dies. So I'm just going to do OC delete pod this. Um, and it kills it. And what we should see is that will go red. And if I run a curl command, 
Like, I, I get some gibberish now instead of that nice hello world. So, like, my API died, right? And before Kubernetes, before OpenShift, if you wanted to avoid this, like, you, what's happening here is I'm not, I don't have any redundancy, I don't have any high availability. Remember what we talked about, like if you want to fix this, you've got to buy a few more servers, you've got to buy a load balancer, you have to configure all that, it's a lot of work. Um, and with OpenShift, this is really easy. And I, like, if you've used OpenShift at all, this kind of becomes second nature. And so if, if you've used OpenShift, this is like, not an exciting thing to talk about in the talk, but if you haven't used OpenShift, this is so cool. Like, if I want to fix this, I can run a scale command. I would, you know, in production, I would do this in YAML and put it in Git, but this is just easier for this. I can run an OC scale command, and then I can do OC get pods. I'm gonna watch that. What's happening is my demo app, where there was previously just one of these, there's now two of these, and there should be one, two. So I scaled up to two, and now I have two pods. And what I can do now is I can delete this pod, do the same thing I did before, OC delete pod that. One of my pod dies, but this is never gonna go red. I can curl it, and it's just gonna keep working. And once that pod dies, I'm gonna run my curl command, curl. If I do this a bunch of times, you'll see like I'm always getting that pod. I'm gonna watch this actually, watch. And one. Um, what we should see eventually is this host name should switch to a different pod. There it goes. So what happened was I deleted one pod, all the requests were going to the remaining pod. At some point OpenShift realized, oh hey, there's only one pod here, there's supposed to be two, and it spun up a different one, and now OpenShift is round robining me between them. So with like one command scaling up from one to two, you have more high availability. Usually you want at least three, but like, it's is super easy in OpenShift. This is super easy in Kubernetes. It was really hard, you know, in a traditional environment. So this is a really cool thing. Um, back to my presentation. I think the next thing is on hardware placement. So I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna switch back to, I don't know where my thing went. I was gonna say I was gonna switch back to extended, but I guess I'm not gonna switch back to extended. I can just talk about this for a second. So this is one that I don't have a demo for, and this is one that I wanna talk about, like where your pods run. So again, in traditional applications, you want high availability, you want to avoid chaos like network failure or hardware failure, so you deploy an instance of your app in like keeping in mind which rack it's on, which top of, top of, top of rack server it's on, which row it's on, which data center room it's on, which availability zone it's in, and like it's a lot to keep track of. And then just keeping track of it is a big job, and then managing where your applications are deployed so that they're spread across them, so if an AWS region goes down, you're still running the other one, like, there's a lot of work, and it's hard to do. Um, with OpenShift, you still kind of have to keep track of that underlying hardware topology, but the placement is really easy. So there, there's two features I want to talk about. I think it's two. I'm not looking at my notes, so I'm, I'm doing this. We're doing it live. Um, so, so one feature that you can take, take advantage of is pod affinity or anti-affinity. So let's say you have, in our API example, we had two pods, right? And if one node goes down, you want your API to stay up. So what you can do is tell OpenShift to apply an anti-affinity rule on these pods so that they never get placed on the same node. So you can lose a node, maybe you lose one pod of your API, you don't lose both. OpenShift automatically spins up another one, you're good, right? Maybe you have an API and a database and you want like really low latency between them, so maybe you want your pods to run on the same node as your database. You can do that too with an affinity rule. So not anti-affinity, but affinity, and tell the pod to always run with the node. Um, so that, that's one thing, anti-affinity, affinity. If you're interested, check it out, Google it. Um, the other thing you can do is is like node aware placement. So OpenShift gives you the ability to assign arbitrary labels to your underlying OpenShift hardware nodes, right? So you can do you can do whatever you want. You can specify a label for your availability zone, you can specify a label for the the like hardware host, and you can specify the top of rack server, like you can just whatever you want, right? And then you tell OpenShift to deploy to use those those labels when deploying your pods. So again, you can do affinity to node labels, so you can say that like don't run any the two pods on the same underlying node with these labels or whatever, you can do whatever you want. So it becomes really easy to manage like 
the placement of applications relative to your underlying hardware topology. Um, and again, doing that without a tool like Kubernetes OpenShift was, was like a lot of work. You had to... Like it, it was just hard. You had to if, if it was if it was hardware like without a VM, you had to you know pick the machine right, and then you had to have these massive maps of your data centers and know where everything's deployed. Um, when you have thousands of servers, that's hard. Um, if they're VMs, you have to like that's just like another layer of complexity. You have to keep track of where the hypervisor is and like what it, it's, just, it's just a lot of work. And Kubernetes and OpenShift makes it really easy. Um, I couldn't really demo that because it's hard to get a, a test environment with multiple with multiple nodes. Um, anyways, though, scaling is something that I can demonstrate. So specifically, what I want to demonstrate is some of the Kubernetes or OpenShift auto scaling features. Um, I don't remember my notes on this slide, but I think the exciting thing here is going to be the demo, so that's what I'm going to do. So what I'm going to do is I have another script here called Deploy Autoscaler. So OpenShift has the ability to automatically scale your applications up or down based on memory consumption or CPU consumption. You have to have the metrics module or whatever enabled in your OpenShift server, but I think that's becoming pretty standard with OpenShift 4, so it's on in mine. Um, what I'm going to do is deploy 3 deploy autoscaler. And what this is going to do is deploy, I think I'm using the same basic deployment, basic flask gap I had before, but it's also going to deploy what's called a horizontal pod autoscaler. So if I do run OC get HPA, you can see I have this devconf demo autoscaler. Um, and it's going to watch my devconf demo app deployment config and say minimum of three pods, maximum of 10 pods. So if I do OC describe deployment config dev conf demo app what we should see yeah I just I'm not gonna do describe I'm gonna do get OC get DC dev conf demo app so Notice that desired is three now. So remember, we only scaled it up to two before, but I deployed a horizontal autoscaler and told it to keep a minimum of three pods of that, and it just did it. It scaled up to three. So that's kind of cool. Um, one thing I can do is go over in OpenShift to this monitoring tab and see some dashboards, and I can try and get the memory consumption for my app. So this is probably what I want. If I can scroll down, oh, I gotta select my namespace. If you haven't played with this, it's really cool. So this is this is again Grafana on top of Prometheus built into an OpenShift cluster and automatically pulling metrics for your pods. Play with it, it's really cool. But I want to find my DevConf demo namespace. Stop clicking and scroll up. All right, so in here, I can find my pods, memory usage, pods. You see DevConf demo has a request of 500 megs, limit of 500 megs, and it's only using like 35, 37 megs right now, so not very much. Um, what I'm going to do, though, is go to the load endpoint of my really fancy API. Um, what this does is it generates like 100 megs of random binary data in Python and stores it in a Flask global variable list. Don't ever do that, it's terrible, but it was the easiest way I could come up with to simulate memory usage. Um, and what we're gonna see if I run this a few times is this memory usage here is going to start to trickle up. Um, it should spread this across multiple ones. I'm gonna run it a couple times. Um, and normally what would happen is ultimately your pods would run out of memory um, the OOM um killer would run and kill your pods and like you'd had just like um things can be hard to debug whatever but like you'd have instability you'd have downtime right um, but so let's see yeah so this is but now it's using 133 megs and like there's some latency here so it takes some time to catch up but what I can do is OC get HPA again um, so now it's seeing that like I'm using 13% out of my target 25%. So what I'm telling this horizontal pod autoscaler to do is if this deployment config starts using more than 25% of its memory targets, start scaling it up, up to a max of 10. So if I curl this guy a few more, oh, you know, I should be running this in curl and not in the browser because of sticky sessions. 
was happening a second ago is all of the requests were probably going to one endpoint. Um, and I want them to evenly get scaled. Um, so look, now we're up at 32%. So in a second, this should go from three to a higher number. I'm gonna do this a couple more times. Look, now it's at four. So describe, no, not just get. So again, you can see now there's four pods, and that will just happen automatically up to 10 pods. And so back to comparing this to before OpenShift, before Kubernetes, like I ran a production environment that run on a bunch of VMs, and this was my dream to get to, right? We had really, really common like usage cycles. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this. Like during the day, traffic peaks up at night, it goes down, maybe it follows like a global pattern of time zones. And kind of the lazy way to do this, and what I think a lot of us do, is you just scale your application up really high and you just you account for the peak and then maybe you double your peak, right? So you just that's capacity planning, right? I'm just I'm super over over allocated. And then your AWS budget gets like massive and what you really want to do is is like auto scaling that takes into account how much usage you're using and what your load is and like that's the dream man but it is hard. like it is hard to do with VMs and it is really easy to do with OpenShift and with Kubernetes like that took two minutes like that was super easy and now if your memory use if, if you so the, the limitation of this is it's currently at least as far as I'm aware it's only based on CPU usage or memory usage but if your workload like if that's it, if you fit within that box, this is so easy to do, and you should play with it. It's called horizontal pod auto, pod auto scaling. Um, so play with it. All right, we have 14 more minutes. I'm going to go back to the slides now. Bear with me, because I do want my notes for the rest of this. I'm going to unplug for a second. Extend. Cool. Is it? Notes. All right, we're back in action. So that was that was scaling, and I think I talked about everything I wanted to. All right, come on, mouse. Where are you? Wrong monitor. Oh, I locked my screen, that's not what I wanted to do. All right, I'm good now. All right, so the last thing that's like specific OpenShift features that I want to talk about is complex rollout strategies. So this is really designed to address the, the so when I was talking about like examples of chaos before, remember I talked about like you upgrade your software and maybe you introduce a bug or whatever, right? Um, and like a really common way of addressing that is to leverage something called a blue-green deployment. Basically what a blue-green blue deployment is is, is you maintain two instances of your application, right? You have the old application that you know works and traffic's going to it today and everything's good. You roll out the new version. And again, kind of the, the easy way to do this is just send all of your traffic now to the new version. But that can be dangerous because what if you have a bug and then like you break all of your users and it's no fun. So with a blue-green deployment, what you should do is run both instances in parallel and try and migrate some subset of your users to it, right? Um, so with vanilla OpenShift, what you can do is just like deploy multiple instances of your deployment config, put a service in front of both of it, you have your main route, maybe you create a second route and you deploy like your dev team or your internal users or, or something at this new route, test out the application, verify it works. When you're good, you point your official route at the new service, done, right? Um, there's a thing called Istio that I would have really liked to have time to talk about or, or, or like actually demo here. But Istio has this thing called the service mesh that works with Kubernetes. And you can like, so vanilla OpenShift, it's kind of manually, manual, a little bit clunky. With Istio, it's just like built in. And so you can do really cool things like spin up your new application and then send a specific like percentage of your traffic to your new deployment, or like if you have different global regions, you can say send this region over here and this region over there. Like you can do really cool things, and you can orchestrate the flow of traffic, like to make sure you're like evenly or fully utilizing your resources. Like you can do some really cool stuff. Um, so, pointing this slide, like 
consider doing blue green deployments if you're not because they're kind of cool and like you know they're they're a good way to make sure you're safely upgrading and things like that if you really want to be cool play with Istio because it's it's kind of cool and I want to play with it more um, so so that's that's what openshift can do to help um, I do think though that there is like those are tools that can really help but a lot of this starts with the team um, and so I think that in order to really like take this chaos head on and address it, like you need to change change your team culture. And there's like two or three things that I want to specifically recommend. One is I think you have to change what it means for work to be done. Um, people on my team like I harp on this, but like. An app is not production unless it's monitored and unless you have a plan for scaling and unless you can like deploy it repeatedly and easily and if it's documented and like you have monitoring and alerting and the team knows what all that is, like my team is probably really tired of me saying that, but I think the alternative is you do a prototype, you get it working on somebody's laptop, and then you say, okay, let's deploy this for, to production, and then, like, that, that's just, don't do that. It doesn't work, right? Like, there's all this extra stuff that goes into running a production. You have to have a plan for it. And I, I think that as teams, we have to really adopt that mindset and, 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 like, hold ourselves to a higher standard. And this can be hard, right? Like, you have you have deadlines. You have, like, management says, this was really easy to get on your laptop is it not working in production yet, right? Like, I think this takes buy-in from, from multiple levels. It takes buy-in from the team. It takes work from the team. It takes buy-in from leadership. And I think it's a culture that, like, we just have to fix, right? So, so that's the first thing I think we have to do. Um, the second thing I think we have to do is, is embrace the DevOps model, right? So kind of in the old world, a developer would write the code and just, just wanted to write the code and didn't want to care about what happens in production. They kind of just throw it over the wall to the ops teams, right? And this is DevOps, right? If you've read, if you read any DevOps book, the Phoenix Project is, is a good one, by the way. Like, this is DevOps, right? You have to get the people writing the code to at least know what's going on in production and then they can start, like, thinking about monitoring and maybe instead of writing some behemoth application that's, like, impossible to monitor, they start thinking, how do I build in Prometheus metrics into my app? Or, or just like how do I architect this in a way that it's really easy to scale or, or, or monitor and like at least get the op like you still have ops teams and you still have dev teams but get them together and talking and and you know build better apps that are more fit for production as a result um, and the last thing and I do have a little bit of a demo for this it's kind of cool is like fire drills so we do them in school right we do them in our offices they can be really annoying because you have to leave in the middle of a meeting um, but I, I think like they're important because they they, they can like if you simulate this chaos in your world, you get really good at handling it. You know what to do. Everybody on the team knows what to do, and it like it exposes the areas of your applications that are not really yet robust or resilient, right? Um, and there, there's a cool tool for this that I'm going to demo called CubeMonkey. So there's a tool out there. I think Netflix invented it or wrote it called Chaos Monkey, and it's this 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 app that you can unleash in your production environment and it will just break stuff, right? Um, somebody wrote another version of it called Cube monkey for Kubernetes and what it does is it will randomly kill pods so it's kind of cool um, I'm going to go back I think the next slide is just questions so yeah so let me let me mirror my displays again <laughs> won't need to go back and forth anymore I'm gonna go over here um, and I have another script called deploy cube monkey and what this is going to do is it deploys a cube monkey pod and it will be configured in a debug mode and it runs like every five or I guess 15 seconds and it will so normally you configure KubeMonkey to run at a set time every day and you give it a window of time during which it's okay to kill pods um, and you give it parameters for like how many pods in a deployment or whatever to kill. In debug mode you tell it to run like at a regular interval and every time it runs to kill a pod. So normally there's like a waiting thing. So it's kind of designed to deploy in your production environment and just turn it on. And applications can opt into it. So like it doesn't kill a pod unless a, an application is specific specifically opted into it. And so, like, I think you can really leverage this on your teams. Deploy it, let every team use it, and tell teams that they can opt in on this, and, like, they set the parameters. Let's say you have a really important app that's, like, not ready to be brought down. On my team, this is probably Elasticsearch. Like, I don't want that those pods to randomly get killed. But if you have an API that's, in theory, like, resilient and fault tolerant, enable it. And it will just get randomly killed, and you can test your monitoring, you can test your loading, you can test what happens to users, and it like it just gives it to you for free, and like 
it will become the norm and your teams will, will just accept it, right? So what this is going to do is it's going to deploy QMonkey configured in the debug mode and it's going to deploy another instance of my basic flask gap that we've been showing off. Um, it deploys another instance because my the one we've been looking at so far using OpenShift deployment config, from what I could tell, KubeMonkey requires a Kubernetes deployment, which is slightly different from a deployment config. Um, but if I go over here, you'll see now I have this KubeMonkey pod that's getting started up. Then I have this KubeMonkey victim pod. Um, if I look at this, I think I can do this in the UI. Yes, yeah, so I have these labels. Can I make this bigger? Maybe I can expand the window. This is like my first time using OpenShift 4, so, all right, I guess, all right, this works. So KubeMonkey victim equals enable, so that means I'm opting in. Um, you give it an identifier, you tell it like a mode, which is like fixed or random, so specific, like how many of the pods should KubeMonkey kill, I'm telling it just one at a time. Um, mean time between failure is like how often it should get killed, but in debug mode, that's kind of an, uh, ignored. Um, anyways, though, if I go over to my KubeMonkey pod, here it is. I can look at the logs. Man, this is really small. I could do this in the command line, but I'm already here. Um, like, you can see it's running every 15 seconds, and it's identifying this KubeMonkey victim deployment, and it's going to kill it, right? So every 15 seconds, my pod's getting killed. Um, again, in production, you would probably not run every 15 seconds, but you could. Um, and this KubeMonkey victim, actually, I don't want to do that. I want to, well, yeah, let's go back to pods. KubeMonkey victim. What we're going to see is every 15 seconds, this pod's going to get killed um, and automatically recreated. And, like, just an example of, like, what kind of things you can put in place to watch this is, so this other line is green now. Prometheus is doing availability checks on my app, and every 15 seconds or whatever, it's going to go to red. So I could watch that and see, oh, my service is intermittently available. I should fix that. What can I do? Oh, maybe I should do, like, scale it up. There's just one pod now. We already know how to scale up to two. Do that kind of thing. And so, like, this, this is a really easy way to, like, it... <laughs> Nobody, like, it's kind of boring to, to do, like, availability testing on your service, right? This, this kind of just does it for you, in a way. Um, and I think, like, it can be a really good tool in your tool chest of building more resilient apps, more chaos resilient apps, right? So I think that that is all I have. And as promised, there's time for questions. I'm going to go to the resources slide, though. Um, I have to find the resources slide. Um, I'm, I'm going to work on this, but I guess I can open up the questions. If anybody has questions for me, I'm all yours. Yeah, here are the resources. So, oh, geez. This has links to the code that I used for this, to the Open Data Project, and to QMongi and HCO that I talked about a little bit. Questions? Yeah. That, so the question was when you, so I showed the leading the pod, right? The question was what happens kind of under the covers? Is it a kill? Is it like a, a like is it a, a hard or a graceful kill? That kind of thing. I think that, I, I actually don't 100% know the answer to that. I think that that's something you can configure with OpenShift. Um, and you can do like startup and shutdown commands and that kind of thing and you can kind of build it into the app. But I'm really glad that you asked that question because it reminded me of something I want to talk about. Um, there are multiple like deployment modes that you can specify, and you can specify recreate versus rolling, and the difference there is, I think with recreate it will spin down your app and then spin up the new pod, and so like, maybe you have a database or something like that that's, you know, you can't really run multiple instances of it, it's talking to the same underlying files, you'd want to delete the pod before you spin up the new one, so there's a little bit of downtime, right? With rolling it, like, spins up the new pod, then spins down the old pod so you don't have that downtime, so that's another thing you can tweak to, to handle this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, th there are ways to specify that kill mode. Okay, and I guess um, the same thing with the, the cube monkey, where I would I would assume that should be like a, a catastrophic. Right. Just turn off the lights, the pod's gone. Right. That that's that's my assumption. Um, I would have to look into it more to figure out exactly what's happening because I agree. Like that's what you want. Um, 
maybe there are different ways. I, I, I think like KubeMonkey's open source. I would like that'd be an interesting thing to contribute is like a way to specify how it kills it because then you could test like how do your apps, like is your app configured to die gracefully, that kind of thing. And, and I'm really glad you introduced this because uh, I, I, I wasn't aware of KubeMonkey on Kubernetes, but this is massive because this enables anybody that's moving to Kubernetes or OpenShift environment to start to adopt some of the things yeah. that are commonplace at Netflix yeah. that nobody else that I know of is really doing it. I've run into a few companies that are yep. you know, supposedly doing you know the the semi army stuff, the chaos monkey yeah. stuff, but n nobody else. Yeah, and like it was really easy to get running in OpenShift. The one thing that took me a while to figure out is I was trying to deploy the app as a deployment convey. It wouldn't work. Finally, I changed it to a deployment, and it did work. But like once you're running, it like it was so easy to opt in. You just set those labels on your service, and now that service is going to get killed regularly, right? Super easy. So yeah, like we use these tools for the traditional deployments. We should be using them for, for OpenShift and Kubernetes too. Yeah. Introducing KubeMonkey. Um, so I have a question. Um, uh, so do you think it's also a good way to uh, introduce KubeMonkey if you want to, uh, if you if you want to kill your service based on a certain condition, like a regard, um, apart from the fact that you, and I know you said that it will kill anything for 15 minutes or something, but apart from the time condition, like probably a health check or anything like that, do you think it's it's a good way to do it? Yeah, so, so what I know that KubeMonkey can do right now is you can specify like the mean time between failure, I mean maybe minimum, I don't know, on your, your pod deployment configuration, right? Um, and so you say, like, kill this every one day, two day, whatever you want, right? And when KubeMonkey runs, um, when you're not in debug mode, it will decide, like, is this eligible for being killed? And then there's, like, a random coin flip thing it does to decide whether or not to flip it now. So there's, like, a little bit of that logic there. I don't know if you can do anything, like, more than that, like you described. But again, I think that'd be like I, I think KubeMonkey is relatively new. I think that'd be a really cool thing to, to contribute to it. Yeah. Hi, Louis. Hey, Alex. Um, do you know what the plans are for extending the auto scaling capabilities? Uh, is operators the answer to that? So the question was like, what are the plans for for extending the the auto scaling capabilities if they're planning to use like operators or whatever for that? Again, I don't really know the answer for that. I, I'm like, I don't have a lot of insight into the development of this. I'm just somebody who's excited to use it. Um, I'm, yeah, I mentioned that the auto scaling right now is limited to only being able to scale based on CPU usage or memory usage. I think like I would really love to be able to do like a custom script that decides whether or not to scale it up and I could do it based on like message queue numbers or something like that. Um, I don't know what the plans are for that, but I, I hope that that becomes a thing because, yeah, it'd be awesome. Yeah. All right, well, I think, I think that this went until 10.35, so I'm technically two minutes over, so. All right, thank you, everybody. Hope you liked it. Um, thank you, Alex. And before we disperse, I'd like to...